All right, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening with you all. It's kind of funny the way everything worked out. When Pastor Mejia gave me a call, uh, he was planning on going out to Atlanta, and he's, he was letting me know. He's like, hey, we're going to be in town. And he left me a voicemail when I was, when I was uh, listening to the voicemail. I'd, I'd already had it in my mind to contact him to let him know that I was going to be out here for work and that I wanted to visit and, and see him then and hope, you know, hope to see him there. And um, when he left the message I'm listening to, I'm like, don't even say it's going to be this week, right? And, and sure enough, he's going, yeah, I'm going to be out in Atlanta. It's that week. So uh, it's amazing how it worked out. It's, it's pretty cool, actually, um, that we had, I have an opportunity to preach here. He's preaching. He has preached last night at, at uh, Stronghold Baptist Church. And I know it was a, it was a really good service there. So hopefully, um, you know, we'll be able to learn some tonight. But I really appreciate being here. And, and you know, the sermon that I, that I have for this evening uh, it's not anything like the last sermon that I preached. I thought I was like, you know, I'm going to take it easy. Uh, I've already I have a, a bad reputation of, of, you know, bringing bad tidings on on the building that you seem to be meeting at. But <laughs> this place is great. I mean, you got an awesome building here. Um, obviously, it's not all about the building, anyways. It's great to see so many people. Uh, that I met last time out here, and people I've known from even longer than that. I uh, appreciate everyone being here tonight. And uh, like I said, this you know this sermon, I was struggling. You know, it's hard when you're when you're trying to figure out what to preach for for another church, because I don't know everything that's going on here. I just hope that something you know was led by the Holy Ghost that you'll be able to learn from tonight. But I, I got to say this much though, you guys, um, you know, the sermon that I'm preaching tonight is called "Greet the Friends by Name," and um, in my opinion, from what I can see, you know, I'm kind of thinking like, oh man, I needed to preach something else because y'all are very, very uh, loving and hospitable here. You know, it's, it's funny how you portrayed to the world as like, oh man, there's a hate group. But like, if they were just to sit in one service and just witness what's going on, witness the love, witness the, the, the compassion, the friendship, everything that's going on, the prayers, I mean, even praying for Amanti, I mean, it's like, yeah, you guys are really hateful, right? This is terrible. I can't believe how hateful this is that I'm sitting, you know, in, in the middle of a, of a hate-filled church. But um, obviously, I'm being facetious. So the sermon I'm going to preach tonight, though, it, it is important not to forget these things. Um, it's more of a, of a, pre, a preaching on love, okay, on, on, on what we should be doing. And specifically, I'm going to be focusing in on many parts of the New Testament that, that talk about greeting people, and, and I'm hoping that, that the, by being here tonight, just as Pastor Mejia is over at Stronghold, that you could be encouraged and edified by even just hearing of the news and, and hearing about what's going on in other places, because it's exciting. It, it, it's exciting when, you know, one, for you being involved in a great church, in a church that's doing tons of soul winning, that's on fire, that's growing, that's reaching people, that's doing something for the Lord. That's exciting in and of itself. But then it's even more exciting than when you hear about other churches and other places that are doing the exact same thing that you're doing, or are doing similar things, doing, maybe doing other things a little bit differently, and you can kind of learn from each other and, and, and motivate one another and be edified. And, and that's what I'm really hoping. Uh, you guys have been through a lot just recently as a church, just in the past year. There's been a lot of, of, of hardships, and I know that uh, you know, I've, I've been personally encouraged by the good reports that I hear from Pastor Mejia, you know, because I ask him from time to time, hey, how are things going? Because you never know. I mean, when the enemy attacks and they attack hard, you, you never know what's going to happen. You never know how people are going to respond. Uh, you know, the, the goal of the devil is to try to get everyone to back down and quit, right? I mean, that, that's what they want. That's the whole purpose of the bombing. That's the whole purpose of the protest. That's the whole purpose of the attacks is to get you guys to stop. But I'll tell you what, in the midst of all those attacks, and especially after all those attacks, you know how encouraging it is for other people to hear, man, First Works Baptist Church is not only going strong, they're growing. Amen. They're doing even better. They're reaching even more people. Amen. That's an encouragement for all the people who might be sitting back, and especially Christians who, who might not have been uh, involved in, in, a, in a church that, that faces persecution for very long. It could be scary. You know, when you're not really rooted down and grounded down, things like that can just be like, oh, man, what's going to happen? But you give a good testimony when you can get through all those things and continue 
to move forward and continue to have the spirit that you guys have here because that is extremely important. Now, um, we're going to look down here in 3 John. We're going to do a little bit of a Bible. I know it's your normal Bible study. We're going to not go through the whole chapter verse by verse, but we're going to start there in verse number one. The Bible says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. And even just this greeting here in this letter, this epistle of John, he's writing to Gaius and he's calling him, you know, my well-beloved. There's that, that, that term of affection and endearment towards another brother in Christ. He's saying, whom I love in the truth, right? You're a brother and not just a brother, but we notice here that this is a spiritual child of the apostle John in verse number two, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So again, he calls them beloved. He's saying, you know, I just want you to be blessed. I hope that you prosper. I hope that, you know, your health, your finances, that God blesses you in every aspect, spiritually, physically, everything, having that concern and care for someone. I mean, he's writing a letter to him, right? He's taking the time out of his schedule. I'm sure the apostle John was a pretty busy guy serving to God, yet he's taking the time to write a letter specifically to one person, which obviously is, uh, ends up being God's word. But, um, you know, having this care for people is vital in the Christian life. And we can't lose sight of that because, you know, especially in independent fundamental Baptist churches, you know, you hear, you're probably hearing preaching on sin. I know you are. A lot, right? And that's important. We need to get our act right. We need to hear about this stuff. We need to, to, to be face-to-face and confronted with our sins so that we could get that stuff out of our life and continue to do a greater work for the Lord and purge out the leaven and purge out all the dross and get rid of the sin that's going to beset us from doing, from running the race that's set before us. And that's extremely important. We need that. Everybody needs that. But we can't get too hyper-focused. And again, there's a battle. There's a fight going on. But in the midst of all of this, you can't forget the heart of being, you know, loving the brethren, right? right. It's all important. It's a package deal. We can't get too hyper-focused on any one area. And as I, you know, when I started off, I don't think this is a problem within the church, but it's always good to be reminded of these things anyways. It's so, it's, if it's in the Word of God, then we're going to preach it. Amen, right? So I, I was hoping I could maybe fix a problem, but you know what? There's not a problem here. Not that I ever thought that there was one, but... Let's just uh, let, let's go through the, the scripture and see what, what we could see here. Continuing on verse number three, Bible says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So here he's referring to him as one of his children. That's why I said he's a spiritual father to Gaius here. He's writing to him. He's well beloved. He's blessing him. And he's saying, you know what? I rejoiced when I heard that you walk in truth, that, that you're still serving the Lord, that you're still keeping the faith, that you're still going strong, that is an encouragement. He says, I rejoiced greatly. Amen. And this is a comfort and edification you could get when you invest in people, when you love people, when you take time and, and pray for people and think about people and write letters to people and get to know people and specifically not just people, but your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because every person who's born again, you're born into a family. Amen. You're born into a family. We've got people who are, other people who are born of God who have become your brothers and sisters, and we ought to love as brethren. Right. Gaius is obviously a spiritual child of John here, John here, and we see all these terms of endearment and encouragement that he's writing unto Gaius. This is an important aspect of the Christian life, and this is also why, by the way, church attendance is so important. Because this is one of the things that you receive when you come to church. You get the encouragement of having people get to know you and, you know, pray for you and love you and encourage you. It, it's, you know, for you to be encouraged is extremely important. You know, being in church, you're not going to get that out in the world. Right. Especially the encouragement that you need in this world. Right. If you're going to actually live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says you shall suffer persecution. Amen. You need the encouragement and love from brethren that, are, that may have already gone through that or uh, can offer any type of encouragement to you to keep going and to keep the faith. But I want you to think about this too. Being in church, it's important for you to be encouraged. But I would say maybe even more important for you to have the spirit of going, well, who can I encourage? Who can I help? Right? When you go to church, you, you, you want to graduate from having this concept of, well, what can church do for me? 
right? Because that's where a lot of people start off. You talk to people out soul winning, you talk to people, you know, hey, I want you to come visit my church. Oh, well, what programs do you have? What do you got for this? What do you have for that? And, you know, I understand that. And the church is here to serve, and the church is here to minister, and the church is here to help, and to help people to grow, and, and to do things for people. So when people have the mindset of going, well, hey, what, what are you offering me? That makes sense that people would say that. But what you want to do in your spiritual life is to graduate past that and say, you know what? I want to help other people. What can I do to help the church? What can I do to help other people in need and, and be the one who's giving instead of the one who's always receiving? Because the Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And, and that's a true statement. And you want joy in your life? Stop thinking about all the things that people could do for you and start thinking about what you can do for them. And that will bring you joy, promised, guaranteed. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And all this focus, even on these first four verses of 3 John, it's all about Gaius. He's focusing on Gaius. He's focusing, he's just blessing him, calling him my beloved, my well-beloved, and, and just trying to be that encouragement and, and we can't lose sight of the fact, especially in this life, you know, we get busy with so many different things. Understand what life is about. Life is not about things. Life is about people. Because all the things in the world, they're going to be gone. Everything. Everything. The chairs, the money, the silver, the gold, everything's going to be gone. Anything that you can possess, that you could get into to be yours, houses, cars, any of this, it's all going to be gone. But you know what doesn't ever end? The soul of a person. It never ends. Now, some are going to be heavy, everlasting life, and they're going to live forever with the Lord, and they're going to be in very good standing and, 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 and be in a great place and have no more pain and suffering and sorrow, and, and, and everything's going to be great. But other, people, other souls, they're going to continue forever too, but they're going to continue in a state of death. It's eternal death in a lake of fire that burns fire and brimstone and darkness. It's horrible, Right? Souls are the only thing that is going to last forever and just continue forever and ever and ever. All these things that you see here, they're going to be gone away. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I understand that, right? There's going to be an earth that God establishes, but that's, that's all going to be different from what we have here right now. None of the physical stuff here that you see right now is going to stay the way it is. It's all going to be changed. So we ought to be keeping that in our minds every day, you know, of what truly matters. People matter. Amen. The Apostle John understood this. Gaius matters. Gaius needed some encouragement, and he gave that to him, and he wrote an epistle to him. And we need to remember, you know, not just, definitely within your church, first and foremost, a absolutely people who are local, but even just among other brothers and sisters in Christ, people traveling through, you go travel other places. That's why I love going and visiting churches. I love hearing the stories. I love getting to know all of you here as much as possible. I like hearing your stories. I like seeing, hey, what are you guys doing? That's encouraging to me. It, it, it's, it's a great boost. I was just talking right before coming up here and saying, you know, this is like the highlight of my week. This is the best part. I'm out here for work, and I got to do that. But, you know, being here and being among God's people, this is like, this is awesome. It's amazing. This, this is the only thing that really makes me even want to come out this way at all to do, you know, to do a job. I don't care about the money. I'd be like, no, forget it. I don't want to go. But if I could get to be, come and visit First Works Baptist Church, well, amen. amen. That's actually a reason to extend my stay a little bit just to make sure I could come and, and visit you guys and be a part of the church. Uh, you know, whether I preach or not doesn't matter. I like being among, among the people, I, I, all, all, all of you and getting to know you because that is what really matters. And if I could give any piece of advice or any wisdom from God's word, then, then praise God for that, because that's what I'm trying to do here tonight. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 1. We're going to see this concept over and over and over again in Scripture. The Bible reads, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. 
He's writing to the Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonica, right? And, and notice, where is his heart? Where is his mind? They have been going through persecutions. The Apostle Paul and other disciples, other apostles, they've been going and being persecuted. And he says, you know what? We sent Timotheus, our brother, this minister of God, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. While they're going through persecutions, going like, oh man, I wonder what's going on with the church of Thessalonica. I wonder how they're going to deal with this. They're going to hear about all these problems that are coming on. I hope that their faith isn't shaken. We need to do something to, to just make sure that they're doing good. So what does he do? He sends, he sends Timotheus. He actually cares about him enough to say, you know what, I'm not just, you know, obviously we believe in prayer, but he said, I, I, it's not even enough just to think about them. We need to send someone over there. We need to make sure that they're going to do good. Verse 3 says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. He's talking about the afflictions that they're suffering. We don't want any man to be moved by what we're going through. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. He's saying, you know that this is going to happen. You know that these afflictions are going to happen. We told you this before. Verse 4 says, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and you know. So this is why we told you about it. This is why we explain, hey, be ready to be persecuted. If you're going to live godly, if you're going to be a, live sold out for Jesus Christ, if you're going to do what God has for you to do, then be ready to suffer tribulation. Be ready to go through afflictions. Be ready for it. And when it happens, don't let it get you all, you know, uh, out of church and, and, get you, and mess you up. But even though he warned them, he still cares about them and loves them enough to say, you know what? We've already told them, but let's send Timotheus anyways just to make sure that they are going to be okay, that they could get some comfort. Why? Because it's important to keep people in the faith. Now, you can apply this in many ways. You look at this and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not an apostle. Obviously, you could see the apostle Paul had a vested interest in the church of Thessalonica because he helped start the church because he was out soul winning and getting things charged, you know, uh, him and Barnabas and many other disciples were going out and evangelizing and, and starting up and planting churches. Of course, they have a vested interest, but you know what? You don't have to just start a church to have a vested interest in people, in God's people. Okay? Love them enough because they're your brethren, regardless of who led them to Christ. Now, obviously, when you lead someone to Christ, I think you ought to have a special extra vested interest in that person. As John did, calling, hey, my well-beloved Gaius. Right? When you win people to Christ, I believe we ought to have that heart and you ought to be praying for those people and doing what you can to help those people specifically that you had that interaction with because you are a little bit closer and you've started and, and created a bond with that person that, that other people don't have. It's a little bit extra special, but you know what? Even if you weren't that person that had that bond, let's, let's be helping those people. You know, the first time visitors, the people that come in, you know, maybe they come in, they got saved out soul winning. Get to know those people, love those people, help those people out. Yeah, Verse number five, the Bible reads, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. But now, look at this, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. So notice what's going on here. The Apostle Paul, you know, other disciples he's with, they're all being persecuted and afflicted. They're going through really hard times. They need comfort. Because they're going through hard times, right? I mean, that makes sense. When you're being afflicted and persecuted, you need comfort. But where was their mind? On other people. Yeah, right. And that's the like, well, hey, me, Timotheus, I'm sure, would have been a very valuable asset for Paul to have with them while they're suffering persecution. He said, you know what? No, we're going to send you off to the church of Thessalonica because we care about them. We want to make sure that they don't get uprooted. We want to make sure that they stay established in their faith. And then he goes and he says, hey, yeah, these guys are on fire. They're zealous. They're, they're, they're good. He brings that report back to the Apostle Paul and he goes, man, we were comforted. That's great news. We love hearing that, that everything is going well and he brought his great report and they, their desire is to see us and everything's going really good. That provided then the comfort that they 
needed, but they get so much more comfort. Instead of trying to think of, oh, man, where can we get our comfort from? They're going, no, we need to help them. Yeah. And, and, and when you act selflessly, that's the way that God will work it out so that you will receive the very thing that you're giving. Verse 8, the Bible reads, For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. See how much they're tied in to the people. Say, we live as long as you stand fast. That's the level of dedication that they have towards other people, having that mindset of a minister, a true minister. Verse number 9, For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. This is dedication. Dedication to people that, you know, why should you care about the church of Thessalonica? Because they're brothers in Christ. Because they need help. They need love. I mean, look, this is, this is how we need to be focusing on changing our lives. Think about this in, in, in your day-to-day -day life. How much time are you spending on gratifying yourself in one way or another? Obviously, there's some things you do. I mean, you're going to eat, you're going to sleep, you do things that your body needs to sustain yourself. I'm not talking about that. But we all have time in our day where you could just go, you know what? I just need this. And for some people, it's I just need to veg out, watch TV, spend an hour of my time just doing nothing or whatever. We all have the same amount of time in a day, but you know what we don't see? We don't see the apostles going, you know what? I just need to not do anything for anybody but just for myself. We don't see Jesus doing that. I mean, the best example possible, aren't we supposed to be Christians? Aren't we supposed to be disciples of Christ that we're going to follow him? Wasn't Jesus the one who was who is staying up late and sometimes being up all night in prayer yeah. unto God. After a long day's work of, of reaching people, healing, teaching, loving people, and helping them where they were, then he goes and prays for people, and then he goes, like, I don't even have a place to stay. Now, you know, we're not Christ, but he's the example. Yeah. And I would challenge you today just to find that time and say, you know, because there's a lot of things that you could be doing. You could be communicating with God through prayer and through hearing from his word by reading his word. You could be praying for other people, right? Having that heart for other people. You could be writing letters to other people to encourage them. There's, you know, the list goes on and on, right? Making the time for soul winning, making the time for, for all these various things that you could be doing that is righteous and holy for God instead of just wasting all of your time. Now, look, I'm not perfect at this. Don't, I'm not standing up here going like, yes, every single second of my day has nothing to do with my own personal just gratification, right? And, and, and that I never, ever just have any entertainment or anything like that. I'm not saying that, okay? But I'm saying this as, as a human being with a sinful flesh, reading and seeing what I'm seeing in Scripture here and seeing the dedication. Elsewhere in the scripture, we see that, that the Bible says, you know, the Apostle Paul said, you know, we're willing not only to impart the gospel unto you, but also our own souls. Because that's how dedicated and focused they were on other people. And the more focused you're on other people, the less you are on yourself. And those things that you think like, oh man, I'm addicted to playing this game on my phone, or I'm addicted to watching this or, or that or whatever it is. When you start getting more and more focused on other people, those things aren't even a thought anymore. I mean, they won't even be a thought because, because your time is going to be occupied with doing and caring for other people. Who's got time for that stuff? This is the mindset that we want to strive for. I know I had you turn from 3 John, but I'm just going to, we already read the chapter uh, beforehand. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5. Actually, if you're in 1 Peter chapter 5, just flip back to chapter 2. <coughs> chapter 2, 
Chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible reads, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Love the brotherhood. And that's, and that's what I was talking about earlier. You know, we're, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's something that we ought to do is be focused on loving the brotherhood, loving your, your saved brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I'm going to read for you a little bit more from 3 John where we started off. And you go over to, to 1 Peter chapter 5. 3 John verse 5, the Bible reads, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers which have borne witness of thy charity. Again, this is, this is the letter to Gaius. Right, just bring you back, back into that mindset. John is still writing to him saying, beloved. And again, that word beloved. And we've already seen that a couple times in the first four verses. Verse five is also, beloved thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. He's saying you've got a good reputation of being very caring, of having charity towards other people in front of the whole church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after godly sort, thou shalt do well. And the, the last verse of 3 John, because there's, there's other things that he goes into there um, about diatrophies and, and, and the problems that were in the church there. He's saying, you've got a good report in that church. Other people may not. You know, diatrophies loves to have a preeminence, and he's not receiving people. But you know what? That doesn't mean that you should stop caring for the brethren and doing what you're doing because you've got a good report. And he's basically encouraging. He's encouraging Gaius, who's in a church where... You've got a guy that is, uh, you know, fighting with and, and not allowing certain people to come in. I mean, the, the modern day equivalent of this, you've got, you've got a guy like Gaius sitting in some old IFB church that hates Pastor Mejia, that hates Pastor Anderson, that hates, all, you know, people who are good men of God that are solid and, and, and working for the Lord like the apostles were, right? And, and, they have nothing to do with these guys, but you know what? You've got a faithful Gaius. And you've got John encouraging that Gaius going, hey, stay with it. You're beloved. So you've got a good report. Maintain that good report. Don't worry about those guys. And then uh, th that chapter closes out, and this is where I get the title of my sermon from. In 3 John, verse 14, the Bible reads, But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. And just that one verse there, greet the friends by name. When you start to know people, it's one thing to know people, and, and I'm really good at, under, at, at recognizing people's faces. That's something I've always been very good at. We go out soul winning, like I, I could recognize someone's face, and I go like, I know that person, I've seen them before. But I have not always been very good, I'm still not very good at remembering everybody's names. So first of all, I'm preaching on, you know, greeting the friends by name. And I apologize if I don't remember all of your names. You just have to understand I meet a lot of people. And I've met a lot of people. But I do believe it is extremely important to remember names. And, and, I, and I strive, even though I'm not that good at it, to remember names. And I think that you ought to as well because I think that's what the Bible teaches. Amen. Not just in this one verse, as we're going to see. I'm going to point this out and say, you know, all of the greetings and the love towards the brethren, we need to keep this in mind and keep this in heart. And when people come and visit your church, hey, ask them what their name is and try to remember their name. Amen. If people come and visit, you know, like, like care about that person. And be, have it be genuine too, not, not just a fake thing. Like this isn't like, you know, we're not, we're not Jehovah's Witnesses where they, they like kind of get real robotic about everything, right? They're robotic about going door to door, the robotic about everything that they do because they have no spirit, because they have no life, right? They don't have the spirit of God. When we do what we do and we serve God, you know, this isn't, this isn't something like we're making a checklist and, oh, I need to remember to, do. look, care about the people. When it's coming from your heart and you care about them, you're going to ask them what their name is. But to help you, you know, just understand that that means a lot to people, it may not be always the thing that you think about. Get that in your mind and say, you know what? I'm going to make it a point to remember this person's name. And then maybe if they show up again, the next time they show up, I could be like, hey, John, how you doing? Hey, Gaius. Right? And, and, and show, wow. And, and that little bit can go a long way with people just understanding, wow, those people actually, he remembers my name. 
And it's something that we're going to see here. I had to turn to First John, or excuse me, First Peter, chapter five. We're going to, I'm going to kind of quickly go through this. Look at all the commands to greet the brethren. So we saw greet the friends by name in Third John. First Peter chapter five, verse thirteen. The Bible says, "The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you." And so doth Mark as my son, greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I want to point this out too, is that we're going to read a lot of epistles of Paul, but we're starting off with John and Peter. This is a common thing. It's, this isn't just something that like, oh, well, that was the Apostle Paul's thing. The closing of almost all of the books of the New Testament, you're going to see an admonition to greet people, to greet the brethren, to, to, to greet them with a kiss of charity, with, you know, this type of, of affection towards one another is important. And you're going to find it in, in, in the vast majority of the chapters as they close out. Uh, I'm going to start going backwards. We're in 1 Peter 5. We're going to start working our way a little bit backwards through the New Testament. Titus 3.15, the Bible says, and you can follow along if you want. If not, it's fine. I'm going to kind of blow through a lot of these just to show you how much is in Scripture. Titus 3.15 says, All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5.25 says, Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. Philippians chapter 4, verse 21. The Bible reads, Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So saluting, greeting, right? I mean, you're saying, hey, what's up? We salute you. We're commanding you. Good job. You know, keep up the good work. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Turn if you go to Romans 16. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 12 says, Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. And this is, these are like closing passages in all of these books talking about, hey, greet them with a holy kiss. Greet one another. We're saluting you. Just, just keep up this fellowship amongst the believers. Romans 16 is an awesome chapter for this. And if you know Romans 16, Romans 16, it's just the Apostle Paul is just calling out all of these people. And this is going to highlight my point where it says to you know, greet the brethren, the friends by name. You want to talk about someone who met a lot of people? And this is, this is going to put me to shame because I just said, you know, got to understand, I've, I've met a lot of people. But I don't think I've met as many people as the Apostle Paul has. But look at what we see the Apostle Paul do here in Romans 16. Let's, let's look through. We're going to read through it pretty quickly. Ro, uh, Romans 16, the Bible reads, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at St. Crea. They receive her in the Lord, has become a saint, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a sucker of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Let's jump down here. Verse 5, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia and of Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household, Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Ansic Ansicritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which with them. Not only is Apostle Paul listing off all these people and mentioning them by name, they're not easy names. <laughs> I mean, all these people have names that are really hard to pronounce. And he's just going, yeah, I greet this person. I'd be going like, yeah, they started with an H, started with a P, I don't know, something. I don't know exactly. He knows how to spell them. They're in the Word of God. But we go on and on and on. And you can literally, I'm not going to do it just for sake of time, but just read all the rest of Romans chapter 16. He continues to go on and say, greet this person, salute that person. You know, say what's up to this guy. You know, say, hey, these are all people. But you know who these people are, though? And I want to point this out. Because I, there's always, whenever you hear preaching, there's always a, a wrong way of taking things. There's always a wrong way. 
Right? The right way is saying, hey, we need to make it a point and important to get to know people, to love them, to greet them by name. But then you're always going to have one person going like, no one greets me by name. You're missing the whole point. Right? This isn't meant to be to judge oh, how much you're not greeting people by name. Right? And how no one's, no one's greeting me by my name. You don't know, you know, I've been coming here for a month and no one knows my name. Hey, look, that's not the right attitude to have. You need to be going, well, I need to learn other people's names. And here's the thing. One of the reasons why people might not know your name is you might not ever talk to anyone, and you might just come in and leave right away, and you're not even being friendly to anybody. That could be a reason why no one knows your name. And these people that the Apostle Paul is mentioning here, these are his fellow laborers. These are people who are going out and, and preaching the gospel with them and working and laboring. And that's what you notice time and time again. He's saying, hey, when Phoebe comes to you, you know, she's been a sucker of many. So whatever she needs, you help her. You assist her because she's doing a great work for the Lord. So you help her out. Amen. Greet these people. They're my fellow prisoners, right? These people have worked with me. They've labored with me. Greet these people. Encourage them. And he cares the most and, he's, and, he's, and he knows all these people because they're all laboring with them. And when you're doing a great work for the Lord, you know, when you're, when you're going out and soul winning, you say, man, you know, if you go in week after week, you put in the time, you're going to get to know people really well. And you should know people by name at that point. And if you feel like, man, I don't really know many people by name in this church, get more involved. And then the more you get involved, the more you're going to know people, you're going to start knowing everyone's name. And then you can really start effectively praying for those people. You start knowing a little bit more about them and what their needs are other than just a generic prayer. Now, look, pray for people, great. But it's, it's always great to love them and know them and know what's going on and what their needs are to pray for them even more specifically. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. We need encouragement. And it's great to have other people there. We saw how the Apostle Paul, you know, when, when they were being distressed and when they were being afflicted, they heard the great news of the, the church of Thessalonica, that, that they, were, they were solid, that they were doing good. Timotheus gave, brought that good news, and that, and that edified them, and that encouraged them. But you know what? There may be some times where you're not going to be receiving that love and encouragement, and you may end up standing alone one point, but there's one thing that's really important to understand is that even if you feel like you're all alone, God is still with you. Look at chapter uh, 4 of 2 Timothy, verse 16. The Bible says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. The Apostle Paul was someone who put himself out there and would preach things that, that were not popular, that would put himself out in a position to just, just be left hanging, and if, if people retreated from him and backed off, well, he's going to keep doing what was right. And he got himself in prison. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. You know, he had all these things happen to him because he was willing to not care what man thought. He cared about what God thought. And that's why these things happen. But, you know, sometimes people fail. Sometimes people may, may back off. Now, I'm glad that didn't happen here when you guys got attacked. I mean, maybe it did with some people, but, you, I mean, you definitely weren't alone. You got strong old Baptist church backing you up. And we'll back you up publicly. Amen. I feel a little partially responsible for that. <laughs> but that's not the only reason why, okay? Because we care about you. We know you're doing a good work out here. And if there's anything that we can do, hey, we want to be here to support you. I mean, we're, we're thousands of miles away. We're far away away from you guys. But at the same time, we're here with you in spirit. We can't be with you in the flesh, but we're with you in spirit. Why? Because you're brothers and sisters in Christ, and you're serving God, and you're doing a great work, and we are encouraged by what you're doing. And hopefully you could be encouraged by what we're doing. The Bible says there in verse 16, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it might, be not, might not be laid to their charge. Again, the mindset of going, hey, no one stood with me, but you know what? God, forgive him for that. That is the mindset. That is the true ministerial mindset of, I'm going to esteem others better than myself. Because I want to see you succeed even at my own expense. Now, I, I want all of us to succeed. But you know what? If, if anyone's going to fail or suffer, I want it to be me, not you. 
And at this point, Apostle Paul saying, you know what? They didn't even stand with me, but I'm not going to hold that against them. I'm not going to begrudge them. And if people do, you know, turn their back on you or whatever, forgive them. You know, if your brother or sister in Christ, just say, you know what? Fine, have this heart, have this attitude. And God, forgive them. As long as you just keep doing what's right. God will deal with that. You don't need to be bitter in, 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 in striving. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. So God will always be there. God will never leave you or forsake you. That by me the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. See, all you need is God. And I was delivered. Even if all of your friends forsake you, you know what? God still is there to deliver them out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 That's a great place for an amen. And then look at verse 19. Salute Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Continuing to close out chapters going, hey, these people all want to send their love. They're greeting you. They're saluting you, saying, yeah, keep up the good work. Timothy, keep up the good work. Titus, keep up the good work. Church of Thessalonica, keep up the good work. Because we care about you, because we're focused on you. And enough, we're, these are all epistles. You see, read the epistle of Paul. He's writing the churches. He's writing the people. You know, sending off a message. It's easier these days. You could, you could do it from a phone. Send off a little letter. It's a good idea. Turn to Colossians chapter 4. It's the last place we're going to turn. Colossians chapter 4. Verse number 7, the Bible reads, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, with Onesimus a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So he's sending again. Now to the church at Colossae, right, the Colossians, sending people, saying, hey, they're going to inform you of all the work that we're doing here. Why? Because it's exciting. Amen. Sharing the updates of all the work that's being done, it's encouraging. I love, I love coming and getting these, uh, do you guys have, I didn't notice in here, but I, I love when you have the, the, I didn't notice you guys keep records of all, of all the souls saved? You got that written? Did I miss it? Is there a board up? Or, I know you guys just moved in here too recently. I don't know if that's something that you post. But I, I love seeing that stuff. So if you don't have it up, I hope you put it up. Talk to Pastor Mejia about that. <laughs> See if he could do that. Because I know like, like what we do, we, um, in our bulletins, we, have, we just have keep the numbers just, just posted, the baptisms and the, and the salvation and stuff like that. Not because we're boasting, but because... Because we love people and, and we love the encouragement seeing like, oh, man, look. So if someone comes in and like, wow, look at all, you know, all these people are getting saved. That's exciting. That's encouraging. It's not to, it's not to compare ourselves among each other. Well, they got, you know, 1,572 and we only got 1,300. Look, praise God that those people are getting saved. Amen. That's, what, that's what's exciting about it. I don't go to churches and go like, oh. You didn't get as many people as we got. That would be wicked. Amen. Be looking at people like that. It's just, you know, you go, look, hey, praise God that these people are getting saved. And, and, and the more people are getting saved, amen. It's even more exciting. Amen. It's great. I love it. And this is what the Apostle Paul is sending, you know, these updates on their ministry. And this is what he's doing uh, when he's sending these people to the Colossians, look at verse 12. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. 
There's lots of great works going on among the brethren in different areas of the world. And it's encouraging to hear about those things. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to close off here the sermon with just trying to be a little bit encouraging with what's going on in Georgia. Amen. So you all can't make it out there, but you know what? God's doing a great work out in Georgia. God's working with the people out there. Our church has been growing and thriving, and in the three years we've been going, has been steadily, just, just slowly, consistently on the rise. We've had more people attending. We're getting more salvations. We're getting more baptisms. The church is growing slowly, and we're continuing to, one, have a lot more people be trained in ministry-type things and going out, getting more people trained in preaching the gospel, and, and the work continues and we're continuing to do just just more ideas and moving in other directions to reach as many people as possible Amen. this is what's going on in in our neck of the woods and i look around and i see a church like this going like man this this is like a twin of our church with what's going on here and and just knowing that wow the same thing is going on over there that should be exciting and i hope that's encouraging and, you know, you might hear about some bad news. Now, thankfully, our church hasn't had much bad news lately, but now I say that, and I'm probably going to go back to a bomb church, right? <laughs> There's going to be turnabout here. It's, uh, now, now, Pastor Mejia is going to get our church blown up or something. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't listen to all the sermon last night, so we'll see. But whatever, right? And hey, here's the thing. You know what the Bible says in all our tribulations? You know, rejoice. Amen. So if that were to happen, I'd be like, well, you know what? Praise God. Right? <laughs> If we're going to be counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake, praise God. Amen. And you know what? I could bring back some comfort going, you know what? See, you know, we're not alone in this. Right. There's a whole church of people that I just visited with that made it through that. And knowing about this and knowing people involved strengthens us. I hope that this church, that God will bless this church. And that you can continue to doing these works and so much greater going in the future. I pray for God's blessing on you guys, on Pastor Mejia, and everything that, that you're doing here. Stay strong. Stay with it. You know, no matter what comes your way, there's plenty of other brethren out there that are doing work as well. And hopefully from time to time we can hear what's going on and you can be encouraged with what's going on. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. Um, for the unity of spirit that we have just among brethren. And I pray that you would please bless the work here. And I pray that you would please help all of us to um, die to self a little bit more every single day and, and gain the better mindset of, of having a minister's heart and a minister's spirit where we start focusing more on what we can do for other people and how we could um, just, just help others. And, and even if by something as simple as greeting people by name and getting to know them personally. Lord, I pray that you would help us all to um, be cognizant of those things and not be self-absorbed and wrapped up in ourselves, but that we could be, uh, be an encouragement to others, especially through the, the dark and perilous times that we have ahead of us, Lord. We love you. We thank you so much for uh, the wonderful gift that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.